Hello everyone! Welcome back for some more Let's Read Fate Prototype. Last time we finished the main part of the book and now we're on Special Act Servants, which... I don't actually... No one makes it special. Maybe it's just sort of like a... I don't know. We'll have to see. There's maybe special chapters for other books as well. We'll have to learn. Uh, considering it says servants, and I scrolled quickly through and I saw some, what looked like some of the actual prototype servants, maybe we get a, a special chunk of the original prototype. That would be kind of cool. With that said, let's give it a read and finish up the entire volume one. So, special act, servants. The girl is once again being toyed with by the Holy Grail War. Well, that makes it sound pretty clear that we're dealing with that. Oh yeah, on a certain day in February, 1999. So we are in the Second Grail War. 8.25 AM. Suginami District, a private high school's front main gate. Lots of students are going to school. There are students who are walking and chatting while linking up with someone. Students who discover their friends and exchange greetings with them. Students who are waving their hands in all directions, endeavoring to make an effort in their morning training to the schoolyard in the schoolyard, while some are quietly passing through the school gates by themselves. In Aika Seijo's case, she sorted into the last category. There were hardly any times when she'll say, I'm together with someone on the way to school. She'll reply when greeted, of course, but she won't ever find herself uh, find someone by herself or call out to them. She also won't ever consciously gaze at the morning schoolyard because that's the one scenery that she always passes by. That's why she's alone again today. She's walking amongst kids of the same age who wore the same uniform as her. Towards the entrance, which she passes through while giving a slight bow to the educational guidance instructor who stands at the side of the main gate. Since... When did it start? Since when did she naturally choose to be alone? Even if she could make a friend who she might call a bestie, she'd keep a, to a certain level of distance with them even now. Or distance with them. Even now, if she were to consider trying to search for one, then she'd probably find one or two classmates. Although elementary and middle school should have the same students, she should, wouldn't be aware of them. It should be wrong for her to say, I have no friends. It's not like she didn't have friends to call as such. Among her female classmates, she had a few, a girl who she speaks relatively well with, and a girl who shares some subjects with her. Yeah, there's a few. Aika mutters in her thoughts. Friends, if she didn't have many, then she was aware of it. Is it her fate as a magus? Should she keep adequate relationships in the with the world? It might be right. It may be right, or it might be wrong for her. Even so, until eight years ago, or more specifically, back when she was an elementary student, she felt like the number of her friends was just a bit more than the one she had now. The reason soon appears in her mind. Eight years ago, what happened to her when she was a second-grade elementary student? Or rather, to be exact, then, not to herself, but what had happened in her own surroundings. Eight years ago, the magic ritual held in Tokyo of 1991 took away her father and older sister, as an, and uh, as a result, lots of the sceneries that Aika lived in had changed completely. The Holy Grail War. The second one, a large-scale magic ritual for the sake of a great ambition. She recalls the name of the ritual. Usually, despite not having to be consciously on the lookout for some kind of magical entanglements while at school, the one who thought like this believes that it couldn't be helped even for herself. After all, it has already started. On the night of that day, although she couldn't clearly remember much about the sensation of the blade piercing her chest, no, she didn't want to remember that, but her fear of the time was able to revive her memory or vivid memories of it. If she were to let her mind wander even the slightest, then even her walking alone, along like this could be an illusion or a desire, but that's something not in this reality. Her real self is not in the middle of going to die by being pierced through the chest by a lance in the middle of the garden, so even that seems like an illusion. Her feet, 
Her entire body appears to be trembling from the bottom of her heart. She appears petrified. I'm weak. She was fully aware of that. If she surrenders herself to her fear now, then there's no doubt that all of her, all of herself will be blotted out in the blink of an eye. But that's not going to happen. I'm going to walk. I will pass through the main gate and head towards the entrance. It's all right. Because this single feathered command seal engraved on my chest tells me that I am never alone. He who is clad in blue and silver is my... Good morning, Seijo. Uh, oh, good morning, Asemi. Suddenly a voice calls out to her, so she turns around. Since she was completely concerning, concentrating on her inner self-consciousness, her behavioral response became somewhat awkward. Her expression really became that of a surprised person, and more than anything, her voice. She might have toppled over a bit. As for the voice's master who greeted her with good morning, everything was perfect with him. A bright voice, cheerful looks. On top of that, he's ecstatically raising his right hand high up like that. The transfer student, Semi, a classmate with brightly colored hair who transferred in at a strange time. Okay, thank you for just straight up explaining who this is. You, Wow, you just very explicitly say that, huh? Is Semi slash Rider, which we saw in the art book from, uh, from last time. Yep, Rider was going to be at the school there. Pretending to be a student. Nice weather today, huh? You're making quite the gloomy face. Are you worried about something? Is it about today's pop quiz? Um... Pointing three topics at her at once, she's lost for a moment. Nice weather, I guess that's true. I don't think I'm making a gloomy face, but I am concerned about something, although I can't mention it to people. Um, was there a short quiz scheduled today? Miss Sejo. You often go to school a lot by yourself, don't you? Huh? Just as I was wondering about where I should start answering from another topic already? I wonder, do you like being alone? No, not at all. Don't you? Yasemi's bright face was closer than she had anticipated. He easily steps over the certain distance which Aika half consciously created, coming at her with a smile in his expression which suited the morning cheerfulness, cheeriness rather. It's a friendly enough face. He always shows this expression within their circle of classmates. Come to think of it, I don't think I've ever seen him alone. What is it? She recalls the pigeons who'd often come gathering at her feet when she was a child. Recently, although the pigeons seem to be the same as usual, crows have been growing attached to her as well, even though this wasn't the case before. Aika didn't know of a friend who'd approach her like this. If it's a human boy, especially so. Suddenly, Saber's profile crosses the back of her mind. Although she has the outer appearance of a man a little bit older than herself, he is not human. So for a young man to naturally approach her like this too is weird for her. You see, my friend was also a child who was alone a lot. However, everything about him is different from you. Semi. Is this friend a friend from your previous school? Oh, speaking of school, Sejo, the rumors of the Southside School Building, have you already heard them? Oh yeah, that's him, all right. Why he give that look? Okay. Interesting. Maybe we'll see that here. Huh? He answered her question with a question. Moreover, the subject. It was like he had suddenly changed it again. As Aika is tilting her head with her thoughts, Isemi kept piling on his words one after the other. According to him, after school, there are rumors of an ominous phantom appearing in the south side of the school building. Or is it that there are gas in- of course it's gas incidents. Or is it that there are gas incidents or something repeatedly occurring in all these areas within the Tokyo metropolitan area? Whether it was a ghost story that he had heard from his classmates or a story that was in the newspaper or on TV, one after another, his stories were very obscure and had invisible intentions hidden within them. Either way, uninformed Aika just tilts her head. You know, Asemi, for someone who just transferred in, you certainly are very well informed. That's not true. It hasn't been long since I came here, and I seem to get dizzy with the stuff that I don't know about. Ah, uh, but, you know, there are a couple things that I do know about. What? About you, for one. 
Miss Aika Seijo. Suddenly, he called her by her full name. Without being able to answer him right away, Aika casts doubt at him with her gaze. There are lots of times where a girl like yourself should be together with someone. And yet, you have taken it upon yourself to choose to be alone. It's true in the classroom, and it's true even now. That's not... true. And with that, Aika couldn't declare it. It's the same when she goes to school, between classes, during lunch breaks, and even after school like this. If she's able to talk, then she'll answer him, but there's hardly anything that she can do by herself. There is... the second, the same exchange. As she raises her gaze, which moved towards her feet, Semi's face was right there before her eyes. The transfer student who had, in the blink of an eye, obtained popularity with her female classmates and whose bright colored hair suits him well. A boy who is friendly and always smiling. Are you... perhaps... In that moment, from his face like that, I wonder. The usual bright look on his face disappears. Do you perhaps hate humans? A feeling of nothingness, filled with a coldness similar to a mask. Just like a... In a place at the edge of Tokyo, there was a conflict surrounding the Holy Grail. The victors certainly existed, but no one obtained the Grail. And then, eight years later, 1999, the Holy Grail has once again manifested in this Tokyo. Under seven masters now, seven servants will gather. The second historical Holy Grail War begins. Kind of read that like a, like a Soul Calibur narrator, you know? Servants. Heroes who have manifested. Saber. Berserker. Archer. Lancer. Rider. Caster. Assassin. The most powerful illusions that have been divided into seven classes by the Holy Grail. They are very powerful. As mentioned above, they can split steel, smash the earth, and even pierce the sky. They who have been constructed with temporary bodies by magic are not proper living human or living creatures. Even if they do possess an appearance that resembles a human, they are not human, hiding destructive power and a tenacity that far surpasses a human's or a creature's. They manifest as they were in legends, but they are also an extract from an old notebook. Same day, late at night, Shinjuku Prefecture. Tokyo, Shinjuku Central Park. Beyond the green trees that surrounded the West Shinjuku high-rise building was a man. All of a sudden, the man shows up in front of a large water fountain which had taken its name from Niagara River, which flows down onto Lake Ontario. Thought we had this already, because I kind of popped off about the Ontario reference. Okay, if someone were perhaps to witness it, then, although there are almost no homeless who would approach this midnight watering hole in this season, they would probably receive it as a man having appeared in this spot out of nowhere. For example, he instantaneously traversed space, or... No, it is not space transference. It is a magic level technique. The man had done nothing more than released his spiritualization. The truth is that he had been in this area since a while ago, although just not in a form that was visible to the eyes. Now then, he was a hero who was clad in armor. His metallic armor, which covers his left arm from over both shoulders, sparkles in the streetlights. Within the lightweight equipment on his right arm, in contrast to his left, is a lone lance. Oh, wait, never mind. I see who we are. Interesting. Easily exceeding the man's tall height, it was a long lance that appeared to be made out of wood. It differs in appearance from the types of lances, which can be seen on Japanese battlefields in the past. This is also true for his armor. It is reminiscent of foreign tastes. Including his lance and armor, his manly figure couldn't stand out very much against the sea surrounding scenery. So perhaps the cataract-style water fountain in the green tree's fault, then that it appears to have grown accustomed to him. From the start, this park is floating against the cityscape known as West Shinjuku. Within this tall city of lined high-rise buildings which gives one the impression of a cutting-edge civilization, 
It is truly irregular, then, for there to be a grandiose water fountain and a green park with an opened, gaping, wide entrance in it. Okay, so man one, is this... Okay. I think man one is... Okay, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see. I've been knocking around the city center. Perhaps I should say I've been trying to make my way here, but... As he closes one of his eyes, the man looks up at one of the high-rise buildings. Looking up at the Shinjuku Sumitomo building, he twists his mouth. Are you really in here? I'm way beyond speechless. You've got my admiration, sir. A second spiritualization. Like the dissolving sound of the water fountain's water, Lancer's figure vanishes. West Shinjuku, in front of the high-rise buildings, under the Tokyo Metropolitan New Government Office building completed its construction a few years ago, the building which boasts West Shinjuku's largest surface area was the Shinjuku Sumitomo building. The brilliance beneath one's eyes, which can be seen from a height of 210 meters, can also, also make the illusion of one glimpsing into a sea of stars. Of course, there is no way they can be stars. Those are, after all, devices invented by humans. In short, there's not much of a great difference between their application and a bonfire which lights up the night. Same as ever. One of the heroic spirits happened to be there. It was a king-like man with sparkling gold hair. Nay, it is the desire of a person who's rarely grown so magnificently fat, not tired of his five desires, oh, this capital which has even acquired the desire of consumption at the end of a hazy prosperity is so ironically at its limits. I am in the body of a clown, as conceited as a king's castle without a king. So shall I burn myself on the fires of pleasure. I will build up my castle walls, all so I can reach the heavens. A hero among heroes. A king among kings. Therefore, they were the wor words that rule the present day itself through the eyes of the city. What a ridiculous thing. In a temple without its priest, what on earth are they praying to? Oh yeah, oh yeah, and they're working together. Oh, interesting, he's basically in the... The classic, like, guild casual outfit, but he's got his hair up. And, and proto... proto who just looks like Protoku. It is not arrogance. It is not pomposity. There are things that must be there, even for him, a genuine king who had appeared in Tokyo. How should I know? Humans and the like don't seem to have changed much since my time. Undoing his spiritualization, Lancer materialized in front of the golden heroic spirit's eyes. Is that your showpiece or a decoration, Lance user? Who knows? Before the eyes of his formidable enemy whom he must kill, he shrugs his shoulders in a calm manner. Of course, he also long noticed that the person in front of him was able to sense his presence. Heroic spirits who participate in the Holy Grail War can s sense the unique presence of a servant. The conversation is different if, it's in a, if it is in a specific spot, but it's possibly risky for a servant of any class hierarchy to venture a guess and just say he's approaching. Even so, he remains in this place, magnificently standing like this. Like this. He calls out to the voice. He knows just by looking he's not your average servant. To put it more aptly, he could grasp it if he can sense for signs with his skin and not his vision. Well, it's not as if I particularly mind. He thinks of his own master's profile. That is, what kind of reaction will she make? She, okay. Okay, I think I know who then who Lancer's master is. Very interesting, very interesting. That is, what kind of reaction will she make if he tells her about this golden-colored hero? Specifically, he was interested in what kind of facial expression she'd make. No way, that's not in her nature to be surprised to know the other guy's a formidable enemy. Saber's fine, but this guy's equal to, well, a reprehensible big shot. Oh, good grief. While exhaling a sigh, Lancer shrugs his shoulders. Although he was whoop, told by his master, I don't mind if you kill him, he should probably leave it right here. At the very least, he's not an opponent to quarrel with in his current state, with his noble phantasm still sealed. In a place at the edge of Tokyo, 
there was a conflict surrounding the Holy Grail War. Generally, people do not know about this large-scaled magic ritual. Only one person must be the victor. It is eight years ago. The manifested Holy Grail is in this Tokyo. Under seven masters now, seven servants will gather. The first historical Holy Grail War has begun. Okay, so we're back in time. Why are we back in time? What's going on here? Very interesting. On a certain day in February 1991, early dawn, Chuoku District Harumi Pier. How should one compare the groups, the shadows of the group of buildings which stretches across the coastline to? Concerning the present era, since, it's, since minimum information has been automatically brought to they who have materialized as servants, it is said that we either fall down in impossible to understand confusion in front of seeing something for the first time, or we don't even feel the shock of surprise towards the unknown, but I'm unable to see for certain. Ah, I see. I guess he had been become able to obtain a comprehension of some sort, for example, about the scene before him. In the darkness of the early dawn, which was past midnight, the sh giant shadow that was formed by the Tokyo Bay Waterfront District's high-rise building, even as he saw it contrast with the darkness of the sea beneath his eyes, Saber was not particularly described, uh, blah, 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 surprised by it. I'm not feeling my words today. Harumi Pier. Besides himself on the coastal roads, they were uninhabited. Saber turns his gaze towards the beyond. Above the black Tokyo Bay, there, magnificently and even sublimely towering over the surroundings, he could see a figure of a glittering temple. But it wasn't just one temple. Many temples forms its majestic appearance by heaping them into multiple layers, making it an extra-large temple complex. If he assumes that all of it, the passageways which are visible to his eyes or something that actually exists and are not illusions, then he could measure it with it measure it with his eyes that it's something whose overall length is easily a few kilometers. Its majestic appearance was as if it had fallen down on top of the sea, just like the starry night in this city which has lost most of its starlight because of the light that filled the Earth's surface. It is far too ironic. Without realizing it, he had become captivated by it. He cannot say that he knows much in the sense of only having knowledge of a minimum amount of things. And yet, it shouldn't be that greatly different from it in the shadow of the buildings running along the bay. The cluster of lights floating on the sea, it's beautiful. Without restraining himself, the scene seemed worthy enough for him to value it. But, however, that was not the real shine of a real starry night. Sky, a real starry night. It is merely reflecting the prana brought by the heroic spirit whom he must defeat along with its luminescence. The name, that name, truly that is a large, shining temple complex. Rider's Noble Phantasm, huh? I don't want you to go, want to let you go into that. Oh, oh, wait, oh, wait, oh, this is, okay. I'm going to be honest. When I'm reading here about a extra large temple complex and the figure of a glittering temple, I thought that that was like, I thought that that was, like, him mistaking a city, like, a cityscape for, right? A cityscape for, like, it? But no, we're talking about an actual temple. An actual floating temple in the bay. Along the bay. Okay. Rider's Noble Phantasm, huh? I don't want to let you go into that kind of place. Manaka. While calling out her name, he turns to the master beside him. As she allows the temple's glittering radiance to be reflected in them, his cloudy eyes were uneasily staring at himself. For example, if the entirety of the city were not the battlefield for which he would cross swords on while seeking the Holy Grail, then as a knight it, would, uh, it made him believe that he should offer up a poem to her, to her eyes which were filled with such loveliness. It's as if the wisdom of the stars dwelt there in her eyes. However, they were they are blurring. They are shaking uneasily. Saber grasped that the reason for it was because of his apprehensions for what the girl was stashing away in the depths of her eyes. 
But that temple was deployed in order to summon me. More precisely, me, Archer, and Lancer. Seeing that the movements of the other two are still unclear, at the very least I must go, otherwise he might carry out his proclamation. You mustn't. By yourself, how? I am aware of the danger. Ryder, who can control many noble phantasms, is a powerful heroic spirit, even if he is an individual. Moreover, upon ascertaining that at least two of the giant beasts which had shown up in its might in the battle the other day were present inside of the temple on top of the ocean, it's not hard to imagine that the temple itself is a threat to him. The temple is, most likely, something similar to a reality marble. Noble phantasms, which are controlled by the heroic spirits who participate in the Holy Grail War, are all powerful weapons in general, but Riders is... Riders one is different in order of magnitude. Literally, he can say that his opponent differs in rank from average heroes and great men. It could be a case where he is calling himself a King of Kings. King Among Kings, rather. Okay, so are, are we getting into that it's... Is it Rider Gill? That'd be interesting if it's Rider Gill in this one and then he gets reincarnated as Archer Proto Gill. That'd be interesting, but I, we, we still don't 100% know. And that he is longing for such a title by settling it with Saber. If he doesn't respond to his invitation to his great temple, which is visible from yonder, then he probably will turn the whole of Tokyo into a sea of fire without waiting for the dawn with his flying solar ship. Since Ryder has just enough power to make that kind of violence possible, there's only a few facing him in number, but he really feels like this heroic spirit is not the kind of person who'd similarly drop threats of only lip service. Tokyo, this capital at the end of the East. It'll never be Britain him, nor will the people who live there be his subjects. Even so, this is my selfish wish. I... I want to stop him. Really, I see. So even you can sometimes whine like a small child. I'm so sorry. Please don't make that face. I'm the one who should have been able to do something for you as your master. Quietly, the girl who is his master nods. Originally, they were unbelievable words. This very young girl, while serving as an enemy who should be defeating the head of a family of mysteries which are controlled by magi that crosses over dozens of names, the one who boasts that she'll do something about it herself and so on, even supposing that she had a natural talent for magic. No, first of all, you should probably judge whether she's speaking the impossible. That family is in the mountain district of the western part of Tokyo, hiding in the depths of their magic workshop which has strong barriers stretched around it. In a magical fortress, or even in a labyrinth full of death traps, a frail girl shouldn't even be able to sneak into there. Even if she does accomplish it, there should be no way that she could challenge and survive a magic battle with dozens of magi as her opponents all by herself. But Saber quietly informed the girl, Thank you. Since he already knew the power of the Master who will face the Holy Grail War together with himself. Honestly, jeez, you really are a very egotistical prince, you know. His master, Manaka Seijo, comes and nestles closely to him. The girl's green dress overlaps with his blue and silver armor. It is undoubtedly her intention to not make him feel the weight of her body. Although they have gotten much closer lately, Manaka has consistently never directly touched Saber by herself. You really can't get enough of saving others, can you? They're so fragile and fleeting. Humans, that is. The girl's pure white fingertips, the palm of her hand, turned towards his silver-colored breastplate. Like that, she placed her palm against his chest. The truth is, the truth that is, while stopping a bit on the brink of it, you always make me worry about you. Her cheeks puff up a little. It's a charming gesture. Were it not for this dark slaughter and slow so on, if it's certainly fit for a flower garden with bright sunshine pouring in, and it is the gesture of a flower that reminds one of brilliance and innocence. After all, all of a sudden, she looks up at Saber's face in a I-just-had-an-idea kind of manner. Suddenly, her expression darkens. I worry about you. I worry. I worry to the point where I might cry, but... As it is, with a smile on her troubled face. But you know, the me who isn't worried is here somewhere in my heart, too... Because I know you won't lose, no matter what kind of heroic spirit you face. 
for the sword that you wield will tear apart all of your enemies. The radiance that you flourish will smash up all of your enemies. Hey, Saber. My Saber. Even if the Holy Grail War were perhaps to be carried out again, I... I won't... You won't lose. To anyone, right? Quiet words. His voice fully melts into the night sky, where the few number of stars contrasts with the ocean's surface. Directly after that, the presence of a giant body comes flying out. As if on reflex, he spins his arm around Menaka's waist, taking a defensive stance. He counterattacks without thinking, while planning only of the perfect defense for his master, he sharpens his gaze. Without two seconds lapsing, the shadow is visible in his field of vision. The gi gigantic body, which probably came flying, drawing an arc from above Tokyo Bay, lands... only spoken of within ancient legends. Not equal to any well-known life form, these beings who have transformed themselves into the forms of mysteries themselves have been classified according to court rank into monstrous beasts, phantasmal beasts, and divine beasts. In this case, this, this great beast is something else. It is something that makes demons fall prostrate, destroys illusions, and governs the Earth's surface with its sacred might. A divine beast, falling under the undoubtedly highest rank if one excludes dragon kin. It's a holy beast. <laughs> the huge divine beast roars. Its face, which should have been silent, is twisting angrily, affixing a bestial expression with its teeth bared. In a form similar to a human with animosity on its face, it howls at the sky with few stars in it. The stillness of Harumi Pier gets torn in that instant. Go ahead, Menaka. I shall settle this and proceed to Ryder's Temple. Saber. Menaka. 
please. I guess I shall probably never become a refined knight. Half automatically, he thinks in a small corner of his thoughts and intellect which instantly specialize towards combat. In a situation where one must show one smile toward the girl who is concerned for the knight's safety, like this, he just thrusts a sharp glare at the monster. In return, Saber slightly shifts his hand from around the girl's waist to gently touch her shoulder. I... I understand. The girl quietly nods. From his open lips, which just wanted to say something, are words of affirmation. No, I won't let any of you escape. Raising a roar as if telling him this, the giant beast merely controls his glare as Saber prepares his invisible sword. And then... Ho ho ho! How interesting. Far from three, do they intend to prove they can take on our beast with just one servant? Although it's a mere fragment of my power, my glory, to take on my lion-bodied beast of the hot sands that can massacre even entire armies. On top of Tokyo Bay is a giant temple complex, a great temple complex. Inside the deepest part of the main temple, in a dark room with a mysterious, ominous, giant, mysterious, ominous orb in it, while being illuminated by the pale lights of a few veins which resembles enormous magic circuits, the king smiles. Fine, then. In that case, show me your struggle to your heart's content, O oh lightless ones. I can't believe it took me this long to remember him. Harumi, the Tokyo International Trade Fairgrounds. Its premises on Main Street. Undoubtedly, the word trampled is very appropriate for it. An asphalt surface which had been abruptly smashed with giant feet, a group of semi-trailers squashed by the impact of its landing. Though deterioration is still being called out on it, to think the outer walls of a venue which can accommodate thousands of people would be abruptly smashed by a beast's frontal legs is completely unbelievable and so on, or someone would think. Since it's the, already the period of early dawn, is it solely lucky for him that it appears to be uninhabited? The battle between Saber and the Sphinx had reached this, an area that is on par with an extremely large exhibition center, its claws which would bring more destruction than he had predicted from their appearance, and its fangs which had been lunging at him one by one at a speed that ought to be admired. It is far swifter than a natural creature's, for example more than the movements of a lion cub or a tiger. To carry out all of its movements so far with its giant body, with how much speed do its fangs and the tips of its claws have? The shockwave and the destructive sound which resounds after they executed their attacks tell of a reality which must be wondrous. While running across the road surface, the wall, and the rooftop, Saber dodges those attacks. He avoids its massive attacks. He avoids its rapid consecutive attacks. While dodging everything, he turns his gaze precisely towards the center of the beast, the one who is waiting for an opportunity to counterattack, while grasping a complete picture of his target as an outline. It is a quirk of his attack movements, or is it a quirk of his attack movements, or a breathing interval between its consecutive attacks, either way he is waiting for said gap. But the giant beast seems to somehow possess a high intelligence. It employs its flying ability to regularly keep its attacks from every movement with every direction with 3D maneuvering, and there is not even the slightest sign of it losing that momentum. What is Saber waiting for? An action that he understood or what Saber is waiting for. And then, again, he shows that he will even execute feints. A deliberate, futile strike admits the repeated attacks. It destroys the venue's wall, scattering it into pieces. Although servants basically can't tolerate attacks that don't include mana, they can be affected to a certain extent by the secondary effects which are brought on by attacks that have mana. Ugh. He avoids the flying, reinforced concrete fragments in that instant. Something that hadn't been carried out even once before. A full-speed giant beast attack that used all four of its legs. His second evasion, evasive action to cancel his evasion action to the fragments is too late. He didn't make it in time. If that's the case, Saber chooses the back of his sword blade as a shield and raises it in front of his own body. It's not a perfect evasion, but a defensive stance which intercepts the attack from head on. A crash. It's heavy. Too heavy. 
using an additional mana burst at the same time as a gradual wind prana release which he stashes away in invisible air, a noble phantasm that encircles his invisible sword, he once again doesn't stop the giant beast's rush blow. An, auto an impact that's ostensibly enough to crack his whole body open as Sail's saber, a delusion like one of a metallic sound echoing from somewhere, except the sound of his entire skeleton creaking. Even so, it's not him who's honestly taking the damage at that end. Despite slapping down on the ground with, well, also smashing some outer venue walls with its charge, the giant beast is probably thinking about provoking him into a finishing blow with its claws. I see. Saber comprehends in a corner of his thoughts. It's quite the beast. The wind, which releases from his sword with a violent force, changes its vectors. From its shape as it tries to stop it head on, he turns it into a fending off shape. At the same time, while Saber spin, side spins himself around and around, he leaps. Using it in conjunction with a mana burst from the back of his boots, he takes it to a wider stance. Certainly. Briefly, he lets out his breath. If you were an ordinary swordsman, I probably couldn't match you, but... He changes his stance. The beast, without carrying a strategy for the gap in his armor, didn't even falter towards the tip of his pointed blade. Naturally, the enemy isn't a knight or a soldier, is neither a tank nor an arrow, nor did it even have pointless magic too. Like a raging storm, it is nothing more than an unusual beast. Thus... Saber makes changes to his stance. After all, to face off against a beast that is endowed with a giant body which, more than a few times taller than himself, it is not fitting to challenge it with a sword technique that assumed a battlefield. Taking the space between his left and right feet wider than usual, he brings his hips down low. Hoisting the invisible blade which, had been, which he had held with both hands over his right shoulder, he charges it with all the power in his body. He rescinds his full-length armor. He is con strongly conscious of the trampled earth. That's this stance is. Something not meant to kill a giant beast of mystery. There are no expressions of impatience and so on in Saber's blue eyes. Naturally, after all, this is not the first time that he had to do this. Far exceeding his own height, one claw, one fang is more heavier than an axe or greatsword which is wielded by a giant warrior, as sharply, quickly, he and the monster which surpassed human intellect try to slaughter each other. Without even needing to count the similar beasts which he had encountered just over the last few days, he has a memory of a battle with creatures who similarly formed, achieved the form of a mystery, an existence which surpassed humanity. Evil dragons, giants, huge beasts, things that growl. He came and slaughtered all of those wicked monsters who tried to infringe upon Britain. That's why he already knows how to fight it. <laughs> Scorching flames, the crushing atmosphere. Occasionally, the roars of the beast that feigns and also embodies the power held by a king. Um, instantly assault Saber by turning into a firestorm that fully burns and crushes its enemies. Seemingly called by the swordsman's stance, it's a preemptive supernatural blow. A furious attack, as if it's made to embody a fragment of the power governed by the Sky Father, Horus. It instantly carbonizes a row of the main street's premises trees as it directly hits the east building of the huge venue with its dome-shaped roof. The east building of the Trade Fair venue, which is commonly known to its youth by its nickname, which is associated with the monster, who appears in special effects films because of its shape, melted like heated toffee in less than a few seconds. If that's so, then where's Saber? Did he get burned by the flames, crushed by the wind, or vanished like mist as he lost his soul's core along with his temporary body? No, that's not it. Behold, the giant beast's head, at the spot where its human face should be. There's now a huge gaping wide hole in it. Changing his own body and sword into a single arrow which had been knocked to a bow and drawn to its limit, Saber pierced through the whole firestorm and the giant beast's head from right in through in the front of him. But the swordsman's figure cannot be seen beyond the giant hole in its head. Where is he? The giant beast, who had lost its face with its abnormal vitality, it starts turning its head, which had probably lost a great deal of its brain and 
starts looking around restlessly for him. He's above me. With the sky silver swordsman, who is twirling at approximately 200 meters in the sky, is firmly treading on, is the nighttime scar starry sky. In addition to a dropping motion, he's accelerating himself by kicking the air in the atmosphere. Oh my god. In a stance that'll execute his second blow, which is accompanied by a second acceleration triggered by a mana burst. Already, he's brandishing his invisible sword in a grand way. With this second attack, it's clear he is aiming to bisect the giant beast. With its face still gone, the giant beast flips its upper body up. Yo, he's trying to do an invincible DP. <laughs> he's like, I'm, I'm gonna hit this anti air. It's as if it's telling him that even damages to the head and such will not be received as internal damage. It aims for the swordsman with both of its frontal leg claws which have been turned red hot with prana. It counters Saber, who carries out his rapid drop strike with a simultaneous attack from left and right. With no face, no eyeballs, nor regardless of whether it is completely losing its vision, the giant beast's claws were too precise. They have plenty of speed too. Whether he's equipped with mana compiled armor or not, it doesn't mean anything before these claws. After all, he is no longer just smashing Ryder's enemies. It's left and right frontal legs, it's red hot claws, shatter against his invisible blade which is rotating at high speed, against his merciless dancing blade. Is this also an infringement? He probably wouldn't call it slashing. Forcibly rotating his entire body to the side at high speed by using the Barrier of the Wind King in unison with a mana burst that was loaded with his full power, Saber was scraping off the giant beast's claws as he was falling. There is nobody who could watch, uh, who could watch how many rotations he had performed during those seconds. Already, there's also no eyes or face on the giant beast as well. Furthermore, while keeping up his rotations, his drop strike instantly scrapes from the giant faceless from the faceless giant beast's head to its torso. Bisecting it, he cannot say that he evenly divided it in two. Now, when the landed saber stood up, the beast of wind and fire was no longer. Only the trace of its limbs were left behind. As promised, let's settle this, Ryder. That was pretty awesome. That was pretty good. Anyways, convenience store? What are we doing here? Fragments 1 convenience store. Now that I've noticed it, I've been talking for quite a long time. 5 minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, 2 hours, 3 hours. Hey. You get used to it. As I look at my round clock hanging on my 6 tatami mat room wall, the hour hand is indicating that it's 1 o'clock. It's the middle of the night. Oh crap. This is really bad. Tatsumi Kitano couldn't help but feel frustrated. His new fair, golden-haired, Caucasian-like friend, ca what, ca okay, Caucasian-like, like friend who had appeared at the same time as reading out the wording that was written in a notebook, which was one of his deceased grandfather's belongings, is hiding way too many mysteries and curiosities about him, and because each of his words that he spoke were curiously stimulating, and because even Tatsumi, who was gushing with interest, was being questioned with this and that, he would extend the conversation. Before he knew it, a few hours had passed and they were, uh, well, they were talking about that. I'm really, really hungry. Since they continued talking until late at night without any dinner whatsoever, an empty stomach is simply unbearable to Tatsumi, who is a growing male high school student. Now, what to do? There's just nothing decent in the refrigerator. And I think there is only one cup of instant noodles in stock. Still, I can't possibly slurp cup noodles by myself and leave my gas. <sighs> now that it's come to this, my choices are limited. Here's one, I'll go get some food and by going to the nearest convenience store. A convenience store? Says Berserker. Well, who's Berserker? Who's I don't actually even think I know who Berserker is for for this. I have no clue. A convenience store? I'm just gonna do a voice to learn who they are. My sudden guest and even newest friend Berserker tilts his head. Ah, uh, wasn't no knowledgeable about modern society automatically given to him. 
I believe, but if I were to ask, he'd probably reply with, Although there is knowledge, I have little experience with it, sorry. I see, so it's like that. Is it maybe the same as the sensation where you can't actually feel it with your skin even if you read about it in a history textbook? Tatsumi dimly thinks. Although he might have not read it properly in a book himself. A convenience store. There's one around here too. I think that shop has produced about 4,000 stores nationwide. 4,000 stores? Berserker is showing an expression that says unbelievable. Yeah, I think I read about it in a newspaper once. Amazing. So what you're saying is that a convenience store where they make meals and runs until midnight is kind of like a pub? My, it certainly differs from the knowledge that was bestowed upon me by the Holy Grail. This is quite an interesting berserker if he can talk, huh? You can't make meals, but you can buy food there. We'll see what we can get there. Our problem is whether miners can enter the store, he said with a serious look on his face. Is he a miner? Then who the frick is he? Wait, why? Who is this? Oh, I'm very... Oh, I'm confused. Unless he's making a joke about Tatsumi. Although, he probably didn't say it as a joke. That's not the problem. Can't you understand it with your grail knowledge? I believe I understand the gist of it. But my apologies, I can't quite reconcile with it. It must be hard being a servant. While saying that, the pair put on their shoes and went outside. Leaving the small apartment, the pair walked through Setagaya Night towards the convenience store. Who is this, I wonder? I have no clue. Automatic doors. Automatic opening and closing doors. Or rather, a door that's automatic. I love, I love light novel writing so much. Oh my god. Oh my god, I love light novel writing so much. Are you kidding me? Certainly, it appears to have that function as per the knowledge that is an automatically granted to me. That's what he says. As he fixedly stared at the glass doors, which were automatically opening and closing in the convenience store, Berserker instinctively deeply nodded. It's deeply interesting. It detects human movements through an optical instrument that has been installed in the upper parts of the doors, which allows the doors to function. What freaking Berserker is this verbose? Who is this? The granted information tells them that it is something that uses compressed air and hydraulics, but Berserker surmises that this door probably uses the power of electricity. If it's been quietly opening and shutting thus far, then perhaps it's the work of a solenoid valve. Whoa the frick? Be that as it may, it's not like I excel in knowledge regarding engineering, it's conjecture. Speaking of which, the main branches of learning that I've studied, medicine, civil law, law, and pharmaceuticals are the main ones. Who the frick is this? I'm confused. I am confused. I have an idea, but it wouldn't make any sense. We'll have to see. It's really that popularized. Certainly. I can recall such mechanisms to have been invented somewhere, either in Europe or the New World at the turn of the 19th century, which is in my lifetime. Though to say that it has... <sighs> what the frick? Though to say that it probably didn't get popularized in this not very wide world is probably just the assessment of it these days. In particular, this type of model which opens and shuts like this would have naturally never been taken into consideration, since it was commonplace for doors to be opened by hand in the West. Hey, how long are you going to stare at those doors? Oh, sorry, I just got very interested in this thing. Wait a sec! Is this Jekyll and Hyde? Wait, uh, is there going to be a picture? There's no picture. Ugh, okay, whatever. We'll, we'll keep reading and I'll have to check it after, okay. Hey, how long are you going to stare at these doors? Oh, sorry, I just got interested in this thing. In the doors? Uh, the doors, yes. It would also probably bother the other customers if I kept staring the at the staring at the front entrance too much and more than anything i'm keeping my master tatsumi wait i okay yeah i think i think this yeah okay 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 yeah okay because he looks like a foreign yeah yeah okay 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 interesting i'm keeping my master tatsumi waiting i'm reluctant to leave my observation of these automatic doors here let's step into the side of the store for now even so these clothes are easy to move in According to Tatsumi's words, my still-manifested form is unsuited to a bit of wa night wandering, so I borrowed a set of clothes from him. A bright blue tracksuit made with polyester-styled jersey materials rich with elasticity. A jersey. 
That's what Tatsumi called it. According to the knowledge bestowed upon me, it is a popular nickname for these clothes nowadays. Ellipses. Berserker is wearing my jersey and white shirt. Usually, because allowing others to wear the clothes which you put on produces a very unimaginable feeling, it's the same as looking into a mirror, where viewing others normally becomes completely different. It's not a negative thing like an unpleasant or feeling or a discomforting one, it's a weird one. Tatsumi can tolerate to some extent his own liableness to look and stare, but he's completely in a bind doing the same thing from the beyond the point of caution. Tatsumi? Oh, my bad. I was just spacing out. I guess clothes really do make the man. Must have felt like he was uh, he I must have felt like he would still draw attention to himself too much if per se if per se oh man, there's so many out of place commas in this, and where you need a comma, you forget one. I must have felt like this would still draw attention to himself if, per se, it went like this. In the Setagaya Prefecture, where there isn't much pedestrian traffic or regular traffic, an antique-looking English gentleman seemingly appears from beyond the automatic doors, into a convenience store enveloped by the particular peculiar tranquility of the deep night, or something like that, which is why I got him to change his clothes. For example, his clothes probably wouldn't pose a problem if we were living in a lively town clamoring with high-rise buildings and commercial establishments like Shinjuku. Since our heights are similar, it can easily wear it. Hmm. Let's not speak on the length of our legs. What length? What if our skeletons are different? Berserker, who'd entered the store's interior, was still continuously showing that seemingly deep, interested expression of his at the automatic doors. He then halted after walking for a bit and is now fixedly observing everything. The magazine shelves that had been installed in parallel right next to the auto glass-styled automatic door, the living commodity shelf facing across the aisle, the confectionery shelf right next to it, and the instant foodstuffs shelf. I can see it because his eyes are shining with enough curiosity that it makes me think that there are no objects that don't pull his interest. He's just like my little sister when she was young, when I used to bring her to a apart department store's toy corner. Now, isn't there too much of a great difference between him and myself when I was young? Are convenience stores really that unusual? Yes, very much so. Berserker nods while staring at the drink-shaped shelf which filled the wall. This entire shelf is an electric refrigerator, isn't that right? Yep. You ha also had refrigerators in your era too, right? We had refrigerators, but they were something that cooled using ice. You see, electric refrigerators came into being during the 20th century. I believe they were implemented in the United States in 1913. That's a long time ago. To me, their cutting-edgedness was also their strong point, because it was right after my death. Well, that's so. Did I shake up a hornet's nest? Tatsumi kept secretly reflecting in his mind that he ought to be considerate of how his new friend, which he hadn't, been, hadn't done before up till now, as he knew that the friend in question, Berserker, was pointing a quiet smile towards him. What? Please. I don't want you to worry so much about me, Master Tatsumi. Although I'm happy that I can mourn... Although I'm happy that I can mourn you for living in... A, dude, this writing is... This feels extra rough for some reason. Also, I went down and I saw the name, so I'm super right. Um, although I'm happy that I can mourn you for living in a modern era that's far separated from my era, the fact is that it's true that I have a personality of a deceased person. However, I'm happy that you think of me as more than a mere record. He said something difficult. While being a bit lost on what to reply with, Tatsumi opened his mouth and said, Got it. While nodding, he said that. What the hell is the throne of heroes? What sorts of beings are servants or heroic spirits or who have carved their beings into humanity's history? Although he had heard the basics of it, along with an explanation of magic and the mysteries who had hid themselves in the shadows of the world, Tatsumi himself was aware that his condition was far from holding any real tight any tight real feelings or understanding about it. Suddenly, he thinks, Is this a similar sensation of Berserkers where when he had automatically been granted knowledge of the modern era? I don't know. If we continue conversing like this, then someday a time might come when I'll understand him. Regardless, Tatsumi had responded by nodding at him. Berserker. Real name Jekyll, or rather the anti-hero Hyde. Certainly, he didn't want to be treated as a dead person himself. Even like this, Tatsumi accepted the words from his new friend who suddenly appeared in the corner of his light-bathed apartment. Thank you. 
Leaving one smile, Berserker moves deeper into the aisle. In his mind, Tatsumi persuades himself, although I don't have the confidence to make a suitable reply for him, he was able to say things in a dignified manner and he didn't lie to me at least. At last, at least I didn't catch any signs of dissatisfied lurks from Berserker, and judging by his reactions, he somehow seems to greatly like this one convenience store chain which boasts over 4,000 stores nationwide. At this rate, he might even enjoy this corner which is smoothly lined up with stuff like bento boxes, rice balls, sandwiches, and furthermore sweet buns and southern bread. But even so, even though I go through this every day, I've never had the slightest of discoveries to make. Whether it's a spot where you're standing, something like this changes to a person with a different looking angle. Berserker is surprised by the modern era. I'm surprised by Berserker. I see. This is what they call equal in a sense. Well, thinking like that, I walk inside the store while holding the provided shopping basket and then... I see. So this is a cellulose film. No, plastic film. Rip, rip. A certain recognizable sound lightly echoed, along with an astonished voice. <gasps> no way. He couldn't have. Hurriedly going around the corner in a panic, I spot Berserker. Ah, he did it. He's gone and done it now. In that instant, he had suddenly ripped off the film while looking at the packaged rice ball. Ah, what the hell are you doing? Oh, this is wondrous. A foodstuff that's been individually packed in plastic film. I wonder if this is degrading polyophin film. That is, indeed, a hygienically excellent idea. Don't open the commodity before paying for it? Is that how it is in England? Uh, no, I just... That is... Before I knew it, I had ripped it off. Sorry. Ah. For the first time, I saw this courteous young English gentleman's face turn red. And it will be about ten minutes from now when I, Tatsumi, will be able to think calmly again. While apologizing to the shop assistant with Berserker in a mad rush... I buy the open rice ball, along with the rice balls that I unintentionally chose and some sandwiches, finish paying while deceptively saying words like, um, he's just studying abroad and doesn't know very much about Japan, in front of the register, and broke out of the store in a minor sprint. While pulling Berserker's hand, I hurry, hurry, hurry back down the road home. No. Wait a minute. Wait, or wait, wait a minute. I noticed this while probably rushing away all too much, but... All the time, I've spontaneously burst into laughter, and in the middle of it, my laughing voice, which is muffled by the Setagaya night, is resounding. I thought you were a serious guy, but you're quite the interesting one. Laughing as he said it, Tatsumi finally felt something. He blushes. He gets engrossed. He has interests, and if he smiles, then he can definitely even cry. Jekyll. Or rather, hide. This is my newly made friend. Although he's not exactly human, on the inside, he's not so different from me. He's unexpectedly quite flighty, but I trust him already. I've decided not to doubt his words. This foreign youth, who has clear eyes, who is very similar to my grandma, grandpa rather. So for tonight, at this moment, I, Tatsumi Kitano, have decided to add one more thing that I'm aware of about him. It looks like I'll be able to get along well with you. Interesting. All right. I'm already seeing a lot of words I recognize. Okay. To my un... Fragment 2. To my unarmored self. A former memory. A former scene. It is of a peaceful time. A special time that was wrapped by a certain love. Now it is already a far off time. It hasn't been recorded into human history. However, there are memories of vague days that can be strung together as legend, Mount Hinderfall. Despite continuously being feared as an uninhabited devil's cave, in fact, the figure of the Rose Rune which brings apparent death on this mountain is already gone, nor is there fire or the shield of the gods which once protected me as I slept. Since all of it was cleared away by my beloved Sigurd's de demon sword, Gram, in the place where I met him, that was even like the final destination of fate itself. Oh god, one day I'll be there, huh? I, who possess the functions of a goddess as the daughter of the great god Odin. I, who am just an ordinary woman. I, who am Brunhild. Okay. We're doing that? That, that, that translation? Okay. Spent days of love with my beloved him. 
I am waiting patiently for him, who has merely stepped out for his morning hunts in the shadows of a tree, while tilting my ears to the lovely chirpings of the songbirds. If it was like before, still with my previous functions that were bestowed on me by the great god, I could properly grasp what those small, charming birds were saying, but I already don't understand them anymore with my body having become that one of an ordinary woman's. Even so, I'll offer up my thanks to them for their gentle singing voices. After all, it's like I can hear their chirping voices, just as if they were blessing our happiness. I became happy. It became fun. Even though I should be empty in my alone time without him. Wait. A standby situation? To the me who was a Valkyrie, it was to decline all outputs and to stay here without making the slightest movement until the time for action. Without wishing for anything, without thinking, without feeling, I would bide my time and turn only to execute my orders. Though it's not like I'm shutting down all sensory devices, me in standby mode was, in a sense, just me existing. Well, and yet it's strange. While well, waiting for my beloved, and recalling my slight concerns over when on earth he will be coming back, I think about what kind of words of love should I tell him if he comes back, and I smile to the songbirds who whisper to me as if they're consoling me. In this gentle period, I feel something warm as expected. Bernhild. Huh. I can hear him. He came for me. Again, he's returned to my side. While bathing in the quiet sunlight filtering through the trees, the ultimate hero who is similarly clad in modest beads of light, the hero who defeated the greedy yet radiant evil dragon Fafnir of Nithaidar, the son of Queen Hjordis and King Sigmund, Sigurd shows himself. Although I utter at his beauty with a sigh, the songbirds are flying about nearby as usual, and won't leave to go far away. Although he carries the shot deer on his shoulders, the children will never be vigilant around him. For like me, they know that he is a righteous person. He is the noble king of warriors, and the fact that he isn't the kind of person who would take a small life unreasonably. Welcome back. I go to greet him with my best smile. Welcome back, my darling, my beloved Seagird. Thank you for the splendid game today as well. What kind of meal should I make tonight? Roasting it is good, but so is boiling it. It's also good to make meatballs with. Ah, uh, Swedish meatballs. Sorry. Just, that's what they are. We're literally talking about that. Although it will take a bit of time. You said that you like the meatballs that I make, Sigurd. No. I believe I surely know that, me, that you mean that you don't care what it is, as long as it's something I make. Today, I suddenly obtained a new awareness about us. <laughs> An amendment? What is it? Hmm? What is he hesitating to tell me? I show a new smile and tell him, Please tell me, my beloved. Every one of your words is my joy. It's definitely true for you too, right? Yes. Nodding deeply straight at me, you peek into my eyes. I'm startled. What is it, I wonder? As I notice, the distance between us becomes much closer. Bernhild, I've fallen in love again for you, who smiles so beautifully at the songbirds. <gasps> it's my seventh love at first sight. Ah, a sudden, new confession of love. I thought that fire would come out of my face at this unexpected precedent. Really... It's so shocking, confusing, despite it being a relationship where we both already know even the rhythm of our breathing and have joined our bodies together countless times. Yo, they, whoa, they had the sex. We've joined our bodies together countless times already. I'm blushing like an innocent young maiden today as well. Even though I don't have a fragment of desire to forcibly behave like that, with a fever that's excessively and steadily rising in the pits of my stomach and in the depths of my head and cheeks, I can recall my delusions that would spit flames if I were to open my mouth, even though I had been equipped with such obvious strike functions. Sorry, you can you can equip her with fire breath? I'm sorry, what? Can we do that to Valkyries? Oh my god, what? I had no choice but to hang my head down with my mouth still closed. 
damn it. Good God, this goddamn person. Excuse me. Before my reddened and immovable state, he gave an honest bow and... Forget it. It's an amendment. One that would be better if I told you I... Uh, one that would be better if I told you that I'd fallen in love with you. Your figure as you were frolicking as the songbirds in the sunlight filtering through the trees is as expected all too exquisite. My heart took shape. My body, which was never been sudden, suddenly hit no matter what the enemy we faced and which possesses natural offensive and defensive motions, shouldn't have known about the rough timing of my trance. And yet, I truly lost myself in that moment. I understand now that I can shake our very selves to the extent of wishing and wanting for the space and time called now to tear itself apart. Even if you were to lose your body, or have your soul spirited away to the depths of hell, I will most certainly reclaim you by defeating the female giant of hell itself. Brunhild. He speaks as thus, talkatively. Despite being normally very taciturn, he speaks fewer words even when we hold each other. Oh, jeez. The person called you... A memory of love. A warm time. Those were very, very precious and irreplaceable, treasurable days to me. Sigurd always surprises me and much excites the additional function called love that shouldn't have existed inside of me. And yet, and yet, the times that I spent, especially while bathing in the gentle moon, gentle sunlight filtering through the trees like this, are in truth something that couldn't be obtained so easily. Just a bit before, my love was to confess his seventh love at first sight to me. Fully speaking, it was between his fifth and sixth confession. I had... A tiny problem. Of course, now that I'm embraced by the huge joy called that person's love, it's not something I could call a huge problem, and it's not like I couldn't recall whether we were in the middle of being close to each other in the Hall of Hindarfall, which, sudden, which turned from a prison of flames into a stage for our tryst. However, I simmered and gushed after I saw him off as he left for the morning hunt. Or rather, it was about the songbirds. The morning hours where the presence of dawn remains, Although I wait until noon for that person's return in the sunlight filtering through the trees, during that time I'll surely frighten the songbirds. The heel which I wrapped in mithril armor steps over the grass and comes out to a place that has become just a bit more open for the fallen tree that had been struck by the lightning. Although it's not like they were entering a person's hands, the songbirds would always fly away as if they were striving to escape from me. Yes, so, to the me of that time... They really wouldn't let me hold them. In truth, I remember feeling a tinge of loneliness. It's really luxurious. I guess that makes me greedy. Being wrapped in Sigurd's love, no more than that. Immersing our bodies and minds in love. And yet further seeking much more things than that. Even if I intended to change it, my soul-carrying hands are something to define me as the oldest sister of the Valkyries who are given equal roles like the Death Gods by the Great God and even if I drop dirt into a clear stream, even though I can't wipe the signs of the battlefield, the death and di deeply dyed blood of humans for myself, I think to myself that I want to be fond of their small lives. Or is it because I had become a human? I thought in such a manner. Thinking on it, when I was a righteous Valkyrie who possessed divinity, it didn't matter whether it was a bear or a wolf or a rabbit or a bird, they wouldn't show any particular reaction towards me. They treated me like something that was just there, as if I was the same as the wind and the earth, the mountains and the sun and the trees and the flowers. Even if the birds saw me wear the helmet of the gods as I subjugated the skies, they wouldn't fly away. Even if I was prowling the forest searching for the souls of heroes, the beasts didn't ferociously howl at me. It wasn't just me. It was the same for my younger sisters. Yes. The me of that time was not one of the humans who cleared the countryside with their intelligence and culture, and was probably a d definite part of nature. Well, for now I am a complete human woman. I'm glad. I can love him from the same standpoint as he does me. But just for a bit, in the deepest corner of me which runs as my heart and not as a circuit, a tiny bit of sad emotion was born as I watched the shapes of the songbirds fly away. All right, now then, let's try being somewhat creative. 
On a certain morning, I, who had resolved myself like that while seeing his back off as he left for his hunt, headed towards that open spot as usual. Carefully alert and without making a sound, I took care to step firmly over the earth step by step, slowly and quietly, just like a hunter, carefully targeting his prey, and not being vigilant enough when I moved that shred of grass. As I did so, ah, uh, I could see the songbirds playing while chirping, lovingly chirping, while reassuring myself if I proceeded further and further until I finally got close to them, so as not to surprise them, so as not to frighten them, I said while creating a gentle tone, Good morning, little songbirds. I'm sorry for always stuttering you, I. Before I could say my words until the end, the songbirds flew off. A failure. It was a huge failure. Then, during my next attempt, I tried using the concealment rune for next morning's challenge, but the results were the same. In the end, they who called out to me had escaped. Now it's come to this. I, who had fallen like a maiden, who has been cold to her darling, and a wolf, who was unable to hunt his prey at the last moment, had no choice but to express everything to that beloved person who completely discerned my troubles with a glance and asked me what happened, even though I should have met him with my usual unchanging smile. So it went poorly for you. Yes. They also got frightened and flew away. Yes. Killing your breath or using a rune isn't good. They'll frantically escape even more if you do that. I see. Know the limits of your body. Stop disturbing their peace for yourself, and just stay in the hall and wait patiently for them. As I drop my shoulders powerlessly, I think about such stuff. I tried to renew my resolve to stop myself from stepping into the songbird's peaceful sanctuary again, but it was in that moment that... The person who I surprising love propped his knee to the ground. With an apology to the songbirds, with much embarrassment to my own foolish moves, peeking a look at my still hung face from nearby, he said, First of all, remove your armor. It's an unnecessary item when mingling in this hour of peace, he said. And then he smiled at me more gentler than anyone else in this world. After that, I immediately obtained the times that I spent with them in the middle of the sunlight filtering through the trees. I won't forget. I won't forget. The morning period I quietly spent while surrounded by the lovely chirpings, the time I obtained that was filled with the warmth and distress called waiting impatiently for someone, the fact that I could show a smile like an ordinary human woman, all of it, all of it was because you were there for me. Sigurd, my one and only hero. You who have given me many things. You who I love more than anyone. My beloved. And that is the end. We've reached the end of uh, the first the first volume here. Prototype volume one. So, slight problem. Uh, I don't think there's ones for future ones. I'll check on this resources available at TME. I'll see if that's available. We'll have to see if this PDF is a thing. Uh, I definitely have it for volume two, but I don't have it for any other ones. So we might have to see if we're going to have a nice one like that, or if we're going to have to move on to other things as well. Right. We'll have to see. We'll have to see. Uh, anyways, this was a good little volume. I really enjoyed it. I felt the mystery was like really good and it really got you interested in kind of learning about it. We're going to learn more about Lancer and Archer, even though we got to pretend who they're not. Right. We read the different parts here and overall, like, yeah, this was, was, this was a solid book. I'm really interested in trying to learn why Minaka is kind of terrifying because she is, she's, she's terrifying. She's actually like terrifying. Right. But, um, yeah. Next time we'll be moving on to volume two. Uh, we'll be basically doing, I think we go one, two, three, four. I think then five, labyrinth six, I think, if I'm correct. I know that the second last one you do is labyrinth. And that's kind of the one that I really want to do before I get to strange fake because labyrinth and strange fake actually have some connections. So thank you all for watching, guys. We will see you next time for some more. Let's read Fate Prototype with volume two. Ciao, guys.